Hello, and welcome to tonight's webinar, uh, my first webinar for PokerCoaching.com entitled A Deeper Dive Into Position. Uh, this is a really, really exciting presentation, um, and I really want to thank you for coming out and joining me tonight. Um, I'm really excited about doing this. Teaching is one of my favorite things in the world. Uh, and playing poker is probably my other favorite thing in the world. So when you put the two together, teaching people how to play better poker is pretty much the best thing in the world for me. Um, today, we're going to be talking about positions, which is one of the fundamentals, one of the foundations for profitable poker. And um, yeah, let's get into the action and let's get stacking. So first, why talk? about position. Well, for those of you who know me through Jonathan Little's material, you know that I was one of the co-authors for Excelling at No Limit Hold'em, and I wrote chapter one in that book. Uh, my chapter was entitled The Six Ingredients for a Winning Poker Game, and that included a heavy emphasis on what I first popularized back in 2008 when I first started teaching on YouTube, the triple threat. Now, the triple threat consists of three components. The first one is position, which we are going to be diving deep into tonight. The second one is aggression, which we will be diving deep into April 30th. And the third component is selection, which we will be diving deep into May 28th. So if you're interested in learning everything you can about the triple threat and three of the key ingredients for a winning poker game, uh, save the dates, write those down for your calendar. Now, my approach to poker is about getting every advantage you can. And the triple threat accounts for three of those five advantages. The, so for the information advantage, that is, a, that is um, achieved through the use of position. The skill and betting advantage is achieved through the use of aggression. And the card and hand range advantage is achieved through the use of selection. Um, psychological advantage is a whole thing on the metagame and the stamina game or physical or mental advantage, depending on what you want to call it, is its own thing too. Tonight, we're going to focus on position, how we can get the information advantage. And this is going to be one of the core principles that we're going to combine with the other pillars to just make an extremely powerful poker game. Um, yeah, so let's get into it pokercoaching.com. I'm joining the team. I'm joining Team Poker Coaching. It's been a long time in the making, and I'm really excited about this. Um, honestly, um, when Jonathan reached out about excelling at No Limit Hold'em in the first place, I, I was kind of flattered, and I was, I was pretty just like honored for the opportunity, and I just, I just jumped on it. And then a couple of years later, you know, I saw he was building up PokerCoaching.com. The site looked really good. My friends were telling me great things about it. And when he reached out to me about this, I was like, wow, the universe has just gifted me um, something I've really always wanted, which was to be part of a training team, to not really just be teaching on my own, but to be part of a bigger team. Uh, Jonathan is an absolute genius, a great poker mind and a great business mind. And I just, I just love working with him. He's such a pleasure to work with very professional. He's very available. He helps in technical difficulties like this. And um, it's, it's a real honor. And anyone who's been following grips between 2014 and now knows how much I love Alex Fitzgerald, uh, one of my main tournament mentors who's helped me get a lot of results. And Matt Affleck is an awesome dude too. We've played in the World Series together. And I can honestly say that his chapter and Alex's in Excelling at No Limit Hold'em were the ones that I learned the most from. So as a coach at PokerCoaching.com, wow, it feels pretty cool saying that, I will be doing webinars like this one, and I will also be doing hand quizzes as well with an emphasis on cash games. I spent the first seven years of my career playing cash games, both online and live. It is my bread and butter, and despite the fact that I've put a ton of effort into tournaments, studying them, playing them, and getting results in them, cash is still my bread and butter. Um, so that's what I'm going to be primarily bringing to PokerCoaching.com is overarching theory that applies to all forms of poker and a lot of cash game hand reviews. So like I said before, it's really an honor to be working alongside these guys and something I'm really grateful for. 
So big thank you to Jonathan, if you're listening, for inviting me on board. So position. Let's, let's really get into the material now because that's what you all came here for. Um, in my opinion, position is to poker what location is to real estate. And if you're watching and you know a thing about real estate or you've heard anything about real estate, they, when the question is what are the three um, three keys to success in real estate. They are location, location, location. So in poker, if you want to have success and you want that major key to success, think position, position, position. Um, if, if you want to take a sports metaphor, for example, instead of a real estate example, playing in position is like having an extra man on the court. It's like playing five on four in basketball or five on four in hockey or um, you know, 12 on 11 in football or 11 on 10, depending on where, which country you're playing football in. Or you know, if you're playing international soccer, 12 on 11. Playing out of position, on the other hand, is like being on the penalty kill or having one of your players gotten a red card or in the case of baseball, you know, having two outfielders there instead of three. It's not a guaranteed recipe for failure, but it makes for a much harder time to win the game and to protect yourself. If strategy games are more your thing and you prefer you know, a war example, playing in position is like having the higher terrain in a battle, whereas playing out of position is like fighting an uphill battle, where you may win while fighting an uphill battle, but you're gonna need to have great weapons which is, you know, your cards, and you're going to need great strategic execution, which is your betting to overcome your disadvantage of having, um, you know, the, the lower terrain, or, you know, in the case of poker, the worst position. So, you know, when you have that better terrain, you can just see so much more, or, you know, in the sports example, having the extra player is like an extra set of eyes in the game, which is what position is all about. It's something that gives you access to more information. You can see more of what's going on. You have more information. And in a game of imperfect information, knowledge is power and it's, it's, it's free information. Um, a third thing about position that you definitely want to know is that position gives you extra control over the pot size. Uh, we will dive deeper into this as we get into the following slides. This is our introduction, just so you can know what kind of terrain we're gonna be covering tonight. Uh, the fourth thing you need to know about position is that the power of position is amplified by stack depth. The deeper the stacks are, the more beneficial, the more powerful, the greater the advantages of having position are. The lower the stack, dex, stack, stack depths, the less important position becomes. Number five is that positional awareness is essential to win at poker. It's one of the first things um, that uh, I encourage my students to look for at the table when paying attention to opponents opening ranges is are they positionally aware? Do they open different hands from under the gun than they do from on the button or do they play the same hands from all positions? And if they aren't positionally aware, it's probably a less skilled player and someone worth going after. Whereas when someone does adjust their ranges from position to position to position and plays fewer hands early position and more hands late position, that person is positionally aware, which means they are more aware of one of the key components of poker strategy, probably aware of more and therefore a dangerous player. And the sixth thing that you need to know about position is when done correctly, when paying attention to the right things, you can play in position more often than others and you can have a huge advantage over the competition in every pot that you enter. I remember watching the World Poker Tour back in the day with Mike Sexton and Vince Van Patten and I remember Mike saying that the goal in poker is to make correct decisions. And when we're in position, we're more able to make more correct decisions because we have more information. The more information we have, the more able we are to make correct decisions. So this is a picture from him at uh, the final table of WPT Montreal where he won his first World Poker Tour, probably largely thanks to the power of position. So how does position help us make correct decisions? Before we go through the bullet points, let me ask you a question. If you were 
a detective solving a mystery and you had a choice between getting one clue to help you solve the mystery or two clues, what would you pick? Let me know in the chat. Just type in number one or number two. Two, 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 LOL, two, two, ha ha, two, 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 obviously two, 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 two. Okay, so we're in an agreement that we would rather have two pieces of information than one piece of information when trying to solve a mystery. Now, okay, what if instead of the option of one or two, you had the choice between three clues or four clues? Which would you pick? Let me know in the chat. Number three or number four? Four clues for sure. How about four, 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 connect four, everybody four, thumbs up four, let's go four. Okay, so clearly, more clues is better than less clues when we're trying to solve a mystery. And another way to look at poker is that you're a detective trying to put the mystery together to solve the puzzle and figure out what's really going on. So this is what position gives you. This is what position gives you is that when you are in a position, your opponents act first, thereby giving you information and you get to act second. You get to act later thereby getting more information it's it's you know it's, it's it's very simple it's very basic but it's so easy to forget about just how important this is and the deeper we get into this i'm going to show you how it grows so the first key concept is we want to have position because we want to go last so we can have more information to be able to make better decisions in this game of imperfect information um We also get to the right to act last on every street. Um, this is when we have absolute position because we can have other players ahead of us. Um, getting to act last means you get info on every opponent in the hand. So the guy who has the worst position will give information to the players who have better and best position. But you, as the player who has the best absolute position, will get information on player one, on player two, on every player who has to act before you but they don't get that information on you. So we're starting to create an unfair information advantage. We're starting to create an imbalanced setup where we are the favorite. And the better our position, the better the info. This is something that um, my good friend and mentor, Calvin Anderson, taught me, is that the biggest flaw that most players have especially when they try to loosen up their game and play more hands and play more aggressively and put more pressure on their opponents is that they play too loose early position and too tight in late position. Um, what I mean by this is when they want to loosen up, what most players do is they just start to play more hands from all positions. Now, they still do it in a, in a scale, in a range. They don't play 50% of hands from every position, but they kind of widen up equally in all the positions. And this is a mistake. We're going to look even more into this with some charts later in the presentation to illustrate the point more. But the problem is when we equally expand our range from all positions, it ignores the laws of position. We want to open our range slightly more from early position, but open it up a crazy amount in late position because we have that huge advantage of greater information on every street um, as the hand progresses. And in terms of making correct decisions, it's also important to know that there are two types of position. There is relative and absolute position, uh, which we're going to dive into on the next slide. So just because you don't have the button, which is where absolute position lives, doesn't mean that you can't get an information edge on your opponent. You can get an information edge on some of your opponents. You just won't have as big of an edge as the person I mentioned who acts last on every street and who has absolute position. So this is a little um, table chart showing the positions to just make this understandable. Um, and we have the early position, middle position, and late position, uh, which is really useful for pre-flop and then post-flop doesn't really matter. Um, more on that as we progress. So the first position, the first type of position, which is the most valuable type of position is absolute position. This is owned by the player on the button or by the player who is the last raiser. So if the button's planning on folding, 
then absolute position would belong to the cutoff. If the cutoff and button are both planning on folding, then absolute position would belong to middle position. If every single player is planning on folding, then whoever opens the pot first, and that's actually pretty important, you might want to write that down. Whoever opens first, if everyone else is planning on folding, is going to have absolute position in the hand. So if you actually know that the whole table is going to fold behind you, and we'll talk more later on how you can achieve this, you can open in early position and still have absolute position. The important thing is who is left to act behind you and how are they likely to react to your open. Um, something also I popularized way back when is coining the term of the money chip. I would really like you to think about the dealer chip as the money chip. The reason being because when you have that in front of you is when you are going to be making the most money. Um, you always have absolute position when you have the button, provided that you play your hand. And next we have relative position, which is achieved by closing the action. So pre-flop, if there is a raise from under the gun one and middle position calls, uh, the big blind has dibs on relative position. They have the opportunity to close the action. Um, something I realized while making this presentation, though, is we can we can pay for the right to gain relative position by limping in. Because if under the gun limps in and someone else raises, late positions react, the big blind has to react before under the gun acts. Also, we can straddle to pick up relative position. But it's something that we have to pay for and it's not as valuable as absolute position. So in the absence of others, having relative position is good, but having absolute position is better and having both is best. You know, as a reminder of how to get it, um, to get absolute position, play the button, and to get relative position, be the player closing the action. The ways to not get relative position would be to be the first caller of an open because anyone else who over calls behind you is going to have relative position on you after the flop. Um, and how to not get absolute position is by playing hands from early position, especially if the players behind you are loose. Active players like to call raises, three bet, do things like that. Um, another way of understanding relative position is it's your position relative to the preflop aggressor. So if you have a preflop aggressor who you expect to continuation bet on many boards, by having relative position, you get to see what everyone else does after that action before you make your action. Um, so yeah, the, the only way to lose absolute position is when you're on the button is to fold preflop, which is why there are many strategies that you can implement to get position more. A uh, few examples are limping on the button when you have aggressive three betters in the blind so that you can call a raise and play the rest of the hand in position with a deep pot to stack ratio. Uh, another example is raising to a smaller amount on the button with aggressive three betters. So when they three bet, you will be getting um, better odds on your call, but also you'll be dealing with a smaller pot preflop, therefore a higher stack to pot ratio, which gives a bigger amplification to the benefit of position, which we will show on a later slide. And the last one is when facing an open, you know, let's say middle position or the cutoff opens and you're on the button to three bet rather than flatting when there are habitual squeezers in the blinds. Reason being, let's say, for example, you know, the big blind has a three bet percentage of 15 um, and a cold four bet percentage of like, I don't know, 3% or, you know, we'll go, we'll go loose. We'll go 5%. If you flat, you're going to get three bet 15% of the time. Maybe you can't continue. Whereas if you three bet, you're only going to get cold four bet 5% of the time. That means looking at 15 versus 5%, you're able to continue. You're able to have absolute position 67% more often if you three bet rather than flat um, with habitual squeezers in a position where you don't have a hand that can call a three bet. And that's why a lot of hands are best played as three bets rather than flat calls, especially when you have position and the opportunity to have absolute position throughout the hand. You want to protect that. And the easiest way to do that is to knock out the players behind you who may want to try to take 
position from you. So the key thing to take away from this slide, if you're taking notes, you want to write something down, is that you want to play the widest range of hands on the button because that is the position from where you have the highest expected profit. If you look through your database, if you look through your hands, you will almost certainly see that you make the most money when you are on the button, followed by the cutoff, followed by the other positions and the least amount in the blinds. And it just goes to show that position is king in this game. All right. I really like the way that Daniel Agranu put this. Um, and he's definitely someone who knows a thing or two about position. Here's him playing at, by the looks of the chips, probably the one drop by the looks of the table. Um, being a sports fan, by the way, guys, questions, please write them down and then like save them in a notepad so we can post them all at the end of the presentation. I've got about mm, 15 more minutes of slides and then I'm gonna field questions from everybody. So just keep them handy, save them, and I'll be ready to respond to all of them um, at the end of the slideshow um, because I see there are a couple great ones in the chat and I wanna field those. So being a sports fan, day on a looks at things in terms of being in control. So the way he looks at it is when you're in position, you're on offense, you're the aggressor, you're putting pressure on your opponents, you're acting on them. And when you're out of position, you're on defense, you are trying to kind of hold your ground and you are reacting to the opponents who are probably putting pressure on you. Because position um, allows you all the things that we mentioned in the previous slides. Okay, so talking about control, let's talk about how position helps us play with more control. So a couple slides ago, we talked about early position, middle position, late position, and out of position. But honestly, that's really just for preflop, which is part of the game, but it's not the main part of the game. Um, most of the money is exchanged after the flop. Most of the money is wagered after the flop, whether you're in position or out of position. And so once we get back past pre-flop, and you know, that was just kind of a way to plan your pre-flop strategy, you need to know that it's no early, middle, and late position. You're either in position or you're not. So yes, you can have better position than others in multi-way pots, but truly having absolute position, truly being in position is everything because better position, you know, well, it means you get more information than the worst position, you don't get control. And what we really want when we're playing poker is control over the action, control over our opponents. And here's an example. Here are two plays which can only be applied by the player in absolute position. The players with relative position, the players with you know second best position cannot apply these plays. And you're gonna see that these are two really powerful plays that give us control over the action. The first one is the free card play, which is uh, an old play that originated in Limit Hold'em because bet size increased on the turn. So in Limit Hold'em, you know, let's, let's say you're playing uh, 50 cent a dollar for simplicity. The bets pre-flop are one, 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 one. The bets on the flop are one, 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 you know, one, two, three, four. Um, the bets on the turn would be two, four, six, eight, and the bets on the river would be two, four, six, eight. And the idea behind the free card play was if you had a draw, in position and your opponent bet the flop for one and you expected that if you called his bet he was going to follow through and bet the turn for two well instead of calling the flop bet and calling the turn bet to try to see if we could realize our equity by the river what you would do to execute the free card play is you would raise the flop to two to represent a stronger hand than you have hope that your opponent would just call fearing that you may have a stronger hand than theirs. And when they checked you on the turn, instead of continuing to bet, which is what you would do with your stronger hands, you check back and see the turn in river for a second bet. And you only put in one extra chip with that flop raise instead of having to put in two extra chips for the turn bet. And this is something that is carried over to No Limit Hold'em as well, because generally speaking, the size of a flop raise is going to be smaller than the size of a turn bet. And it also gives us a lot of control because, you know, we have the implied threat of are we going to bet the turn and the river? Um, and we have a lot more flexibility 
and power because we have position. The second play is the free showdown play, which is in my, in my understanding, purely a no limit play that originated in no limit. And the idea is very similar to the free card play, but instead of executing on the flop, it's executed on the turn. And the way this play works is when your opponent bets the turn for whatever amount is, um, we'll just say, you know, he bets $50 into a pot where the size isn't relevant. And um, you assume that he's going to bet the river for, you know, 75 or 100 or 150. What you would do instead of calling the turn bets to, you know, evaluate on the river, you would raise the turn bet. You know, if you're planning to call the river, you would raise the turn bet to say 100 or 120. And then when he checks to you on the river, you have the option to just check and show down your hand for the price of your raise on the turn, which you set the price rather than the price of their river bet. So again, you, by doing the free showdown play, which you can only do in position, you are taking control. You are choosing the price for which you are going to show down your hand on the turn rather than letting them choose the price of the showdown by calling their bet and calling again. Um, plus, with the free showdown play, you also have the opportunity to bet the river after raising the turn. Um, you know, like it's a very strong line to call flop, raise turn, and bet river. And that's why this is a great play to make with the nuts, uh, but also with draws so that you can add fold equity to your draws and not only win the pot when you make your hand, but also have a chance to win the pot by making your opponent fold. And a really great play to make with blockers because even though they may not, your opponent might fear the turn bet that much, they may fear that a bigger bet is coming on the river and say, well, I don't want to put this money in on the turn if I can't call the river and I assume my opponent's going to bet the river. So they may fold to the turn bet because of the threat of a river bet. Um, and that's how you can get a lot more fold equity with little risk and it comes in position. There is no play out of position that achieves the same thing that these two plays do. And this is just another example of just how powerful position is. Um, another thing about being in position, as I mentioned, is when you're in position, you have the right to last action and thus the ability to build the pot greatly compared to your opponents who are out of position. So in cash game poker, um, the play is typically 100 big blinds, which means we play flops, turns, and rivers, unlike tournaments where a lot of time it's pre-flop and flop. Um, so this is kind of what pot growth looks like. This is an image from uh, my book, The Cash Game Guide. So because of the extra info, we get to apply it on bigger, more meaningful streets. So you don't just get to apply your positional advantage on the flop, which you can see is much more significant than pre-flop. You also get to apply it on the turn, which is much more significant than both flop and pre-flop. In fact, it's more significant than both of them put together. And you get to apply it on the river, which is even bigger. Um, so, you know, this is how a poker hand goes. You know, we, we start the hand with little information and we make little bets and then the pot grows where we have more information and, and the bets get bigger. And then as we get to the later and later streets, the pots get to their biggest. And the imposition player who gets right to last action, right to grow the pot one more time over their opponents, gets the most info and gets the opportunity to make the biggest bet. So like, just think about how big an advantage that is. Not only do you get more information than your opponents, but you also get the choice, the strategic option to apply that information when the stakes are at their highest. It's massive. Now, when I first saw this image, it didn't quite do it justice. So what I did was um, I made one in paint, forgive my non-elite skills. I'm just a poker teacher. I'm not a graphic designer. And I put the image together to show just how significant the later street play is relative to the earlier street play. Um, and the deeper the stacks, 
the more we're playing in the red zone, you know, the yellow zone, the red zone, and even beyond the red zone as the stacks get very deep. And again, the player with position has an advantage in all these circles. So the deeper the stacks, the more streets we play, the more betting we do, the bigger the bets, the bigger the advantage for the player in position. And this is why relative position is overrated. How many blue circles are there in the red one? How many green circles are there in the red one? Relative position is really most valuable in, in early streets when the pots are multi-way. And usually by the river, if the pots have grown, you're going to be heads up. And once again, you're either in position or you're not. Um, so a little story from a session I played last month at Falls View. I was playing a 2-5 game, deep stack buy-in. You can buy in for $1,000. And it was getting into the evening. The game was loosening up a bit. And this guy came to the table who just was really action player. Um, he decided he was going to blind raise every hand from every position. You don't get a strategic option when you do that. It's not like a straddle. You just have to check unless it gets raised ahead of you. And I was sitting to his right, which isn't the best thing. You know, I don't have position on this player who is ready to give action, putting a lot of pressure on everyone. But I figured out that instead of raising my hands and then giving him the option to take his money back, if I limped in, he had a check, it had to go through him, everyone else had to act, and then I could see how everyone was acting before I really made my decision. I just limp in for five, get all the information that make my decision. It's kind of like straddling. And it, it was, I thought it was really awesome. You know, I'm getting all this information. I can do limp raises. I can do squeezes. But what I realized was, except for the hands where he was blind raising to 30 or $50, where I could get a lot of money in preflop, getting to limp call with relative position or even limp raise to small amounts with relative position wasn't that valuable because when we were playing 200, 300 big blind deep poker, most of the action, most of the significant meaningful money was going in after the flop and I was playing out of position on those streets. So I realized after about 45 minutes of this that actually despite the fact I thought I had a good position that I didn't have that great of a position and I actually ended up quitting the game because of that, which I, I thought was a little ludicrous. I'm like, I have a guy blind raising every hand, and yet I don't think it's a great spot for me. And I realized it was because of my position that the spot wasn't good. And this is why the Mississippi straddle, where you can uh, straddle on the button, is so powerful. You get to play a bigger pot with absolute position every hand, and you also get to see how the blinds react before you make your decision. It's a huge advantage. And this is why relative position, in my opinion, is overrated compared to absolute position. Now, as stacks get deeper, the power of position amplifies. So I, I hinted on it a bit there. We're gonna dive a little bit deeper on that. So how position gets amplified as stacks get deeper. So this is a well-known fact among pro players, but not so well-known by new players, that um, assuming no rake, money won at poker has to come from people who are losing. And all things being equal, the chips are going to flow to the left. The chips are going to flow to the players who are in position. The chips are going to flow to the players who have more information and get to act last with more information for higher stakes. So first example, we have a player who is gonna lose 100 big blinds in a game. And the assumption without factoring position is that all players of equal skill at this nine-handed game are gonna split up the money. So if this player, seat one, is gonna lose uh, 100 big blinds, then everyone else at the table is gonna pick up um, 12 and a half big blinds, right? Wrong. Uh, that is not the case because when we factor in position, we actually see that um, the player with direct position on the dead money player, the weaker player, is going to get the majority of that money in expected value with a significant decrease moving to seat three and then four and five. And I actually didn't even include seats six, seven, and eight because they're far enough away that they aren't going to see much of the profit. Much, Most of the profit is going to be acquired by the people who have immediate position on the dead money spot, the mark, whatever you want to call that um, player at the table, and actually seat six, seven, and eight because they're kind of out of position 
to the player in seat one are actually probably going to be leaking some of the money to seat one. Uh, but that would get the chart very complicated. So um, this is kind of the baseline if you have a losing player and everyone else who's equal skill. And then as the skill gap comes into play and it's more significant, the um, the graphs would change slightly. So these aren't exact numbers, but I feel like the visualization helps to illustrate the concept. And I'm someone who really likes to do both uh, words and numbers as well as images so that both sides of the brain can get activated and help to retain the information. And this is why coming up when I was really playing tons of hands online, millions of hands online, um, we call the seat directly left of the mark, the Jesus seat or the God seat, because that's the seat that was going to make the most money. And if I could sit in a game with direct position on the weaker player, I was all about it. And if I was going to have the worst seat relative to the weak player, I wouldn't even sit in the game because I wasn't going to get any of the profit. It was already going to be gone um, by the time I got to act on my hand. So this is why when you have a choice of seat, you want to choose the seat in position on the dead money because that is the seat with the highest expectation. You can do everything else the same, but if you improve your position relative to the weaker players, you will win more money. There is no buts about it. And um, <laughs> I had a funny story um, at Falls View. I was playing, I, I moved to another 2-5 table and there was, there was you know a spot in the game and I learned on the first hand that this guy was less experienced and we were chatting back and forth and he's like, yeah, I'm going to keep an eye on you. I want to get you. I'm going to get closer to you. So when a seat opened up, there are actually two seats open on my left and right. He moved directly to my right because he wanted to be close to me and keep an eye on me. And I just laughed so hard when he was like, I'm going to get you. I'm coming for you. Sits directly on my right. And I just looked and I said, good luck, brother. I wish you all the best because you're going to need it. And Looking at these graphs, just to understand it more, the deeper the stacks would be, the more or the more reloads that the player who is going to donate, you know, 200, 300, 500 big blinds to the game, whatever it is, the more that these bars would stretch out vertically, but the ratios would stay the same. The thing that would adjust the ratios is the skill gap, which we will talk about in the presentation on aggression and betting. All right. So. What about adjusting your stacks as the play gets deeper? I'm just going to touch on this briefly because we're very deep into this topic. And um, this is also one that has more to do with selection, which we will cover in the uh, webinar in May. Um, but it's always good to plant a seed. So right now we're going to plant a seed, a money seed. And what do money seeds grow? Let me know in the chat. Okay, so dead money could mean lots. Uh, we're going to talk about adjusting to dead money. So this is just ranges pre-ante. This is from, um, I, I believe that I have this in my chapter in Excelling at No Limit Hold'em and in the Cash Game Guide. And it's just one strategy you can use for ranges pre-ante. This is not set in stone. Um, the concept is more important than the specific numbers. I didn't use solvers to generate this, so I don't know if it's exact. And it also depends on so many factors what your exact ranges should be. So it's not important to get locked in on the specifics, but just to understand the concept. And when we add dead money, which could be anti in the game, it could be deeper stacks, or it could be a bigger skill gap, which means there's more money up for grabs. I just wrote post ante as an example, it's worth adjusting for. So, um, you know, range one, we have the standard opening strategy generalized and, and then range two is how I originally thought I would adjust to an ante. Cause this is something that always, you know, I struggled with in tournaments and I wanted to know the answer. And I thought, well, if there's 67% more dead money, I should play 67% more hands, right? So I just imp increased my range 67% by all positions, but this is wrong. Why? We talked about it. We touched on it earlier in the presentation and it's that in early position, the odds of running into a hand and therefore the odds of having to play out of position are still the same when facing eight opponents. They're very high. And so we should be careful yet. You know, the odds of getting a raise through when facing only two to four opponents are still quite high. 
Yes, we're going to run into a hand sometimes, but we're going to get our raise through more often than not. Whereas when we're raising from early position, we are not going to get our raise through more often than not. And so we should be more aggressive in position. So it's correct to adjust our ranges from all position, but only slightly in early position. And once we get to late position, that's when we really want to jack it up. So this is how I adjust my ranges when there is more dead money in the game. I, if you notice compared between the pre-ante graph and the ranges post adjusted for position, I am playing more hands from all positions, but the increase in early positions is quite small, 2%, 2%, 3%, 7%. 7 and then when we get to late position, it shoots up. I would actually, you know, going back, I would make this 18% and this 26%. So it really just shoots up near the end, just taking off in the cutoff and button. And you, if you notice, if you count up the numbers, the green and yellow charts are the same total percentage of hands between you know your nine spots on the table. You're playing the same number of hands with these two strategies, but the green chart is not adjusted for position and the yellow chart is heavily adjusted for position. And this is what I talked about before uh, for correct loosening up, for correct lagging it up. This is what my mentor taught me was that you got to respect early position. But when it comes to late position, especially when there's dead money up for grabs, you can go crazy. Um, and the reason I did include the small blind is because it's so dependent on the big blind. And, you know, honestly, when the blinds, when both blinds are super tight, you can go even wider. You can open 100% of buttons. You can open 70% of cutoffs, 50% of hijacks and get away with it on certain tables. Um, but you can't get away with opening 50% of hands from under the gun almost no matter what, because when there are eight players left to act, people wake up with hands. So, again, the concept is really key to understand here that we can drastically adjust our ranges when we are in late position and we can do that even more when stacks are deeper um, so seven years ago or so uh, at the world series after the world series of poker uh, i went with greg merson to jacksonville florida where he got invited to play a cash game and he was playing something big i think it was either 50 50 100 200 or 100 200 or 400 some huge game in, in, a, in a back room at um, Best Bet Jacksonville. And he was talking about strategy because the game was really deep. And what he told me was that, you know, the three bet ranges drastically changed. So, you know, if, if he was out of position facing, you know, he's in the big blind and, or the small blind, he's facing a button open from a loose player. Uh, with 100 big blind stacks, he may three bet something like 15% of hands, which is fairly wide. It's pretty much all the Broadway hands um, and a lot of the you know bigger pairs. But if he was 200 big blinds deep to 50, that number might drop to something like 5%. And once they got into the 300, 400, 500 big blind range, he was three betting 0%. This is the world champion millions of cash games played online, Supernova Elite, man knew his strategy. And he's saying, yeah, 300, 400 big blinds deep. I'm not even three betting aces out of position because how much money can I get in preflop? And now I have to play so many streets, huge bets out of position for the rest of the hand. Not a good look. Um, and likewise, to counterbalance this in position as stacks get deeper, we can three bet so much wider. So for example, if you're again, taking that loose strategy, um, button versus cutoff, and you want to three bet that loose opener, 15% of hands, because you know, maybe they're opening 25, 35% of hands. You want to buy the button, you know, protect your position and lock it down for the rest of the hand. You might three bet 15% of hands. Um, but once you get to 200, 250 big blinds, you can up that to 25%, 300 to 500 big blinds. You could go as wide as 35%, maybe even more. And, um, you know, the next year, 2013, I was in Macau with Tony. He was playing cash games to prepare for the one drop, which he ended up winning. And he told me one night he, he went to go play some cash at uh, the win. And he came back 30 minutes later. I'm like, Tony, what are you doing home? So like, you just, you just left for your session. He's like, yeah, 
I had a really bad seat. I was sitting out of position to rage in and he just three bet me every single time I opened every single time I opened. And I'm like, well, you know, why don't you just four bet him or, you know, like open fewer hands. And he's like, Ev, when you're playing over 400 big blinds deep out of position, if someone wants to make your life hell by three betting you every hand or flatting you and then, you know, making moves on your post flop, there's not much you can do about it other than change seats. And this is one of the very best players in the world. And he just left the game. He's like, don't have a good seat. Players playing very aggressive against me in position deep stack. Nothing I can do about it. And so he quit. And position is that powerful. Because what can you do? Flat out of position? You know, according to Alex Fitzgerald, that's the biggest sucker bet in poker. What's your other option? Four bet, define your range, and still have a massive pot to stack ratio after the flop out of position. Um, there's just not too much you can do, which is why as stacks get deeper, position gets so much more valuable and should be a primary component of your winning poker strategy. So again, uh, position is to poker what location is to real estate. And just like in real estate, the bigger the investment, which is your stack depth, as in property buy, the more significant it is. Uh, position is an expected value multiplier on whatever amount you are potentially playing for. Okay, so coming to the close, how can we get position more often in profit? Uh, first thing to do is grab the best seat on the table. You want to have the tight players on your left because then you can buy the button more often. They're going to be more predictable and you want the loose players on your right so that you can attack their wide ranges more effectively and, you know, buy the button by three betting those loose players and forcing the players behind you out of the pot. Next thing to do is follow the game flow. Notice if people are getting frustrated, emotional, ready to loosen up and play more hands. If they are and they have position on you, the natural thing to do is just tighten up. And if they aren't, continue to play your wide range of hands. Huge one, look left, get tells. This is the biggest thing. I talk about this for probably half an hour in my excelling webinar I did with uh, Jonathan on how I got a life-changing tournament score, my biggest win ever. And it's looking left, getting information, seeing if people are showing intention tells and showing a plan to play a hand. Because if someone's planning to play a hand, you can fold half of the hands you were otherwise gonna open because most of those hands won't show a profit once you're gonna be out of position. Likewise, if people are showing that they are planning on folding their hands, you can pretend they're not there and know that your odds of having absolute position for the rest of the hand are that much better. Likewise, some players will not call big raises. So in close spots where someone might wanna play but they aren't showing they have a super strong hand, you can go ahead and make a 4X or 5X raise to get folds. In deep stack cash games, this works fine and we will dive deeper to that into the aggression lesson because it's a huge topic and there is a fine art to that bet sizing. And finally, you want to own the meta game because if people don't want to play with you, if you have fear equity over them, if they feel like you hold over them, they will respect your raises and fold to your opens, which is ideal because you will get position more often. Okay. And uh, note a little trick about relative position I mentioned earlier is that you can open limp. It's a very cheap way to get information from the rest of the table. The other option is straddling and that way when people raise, you'll be last to act. Note, this should only really be done when there is a maniac on the table or you have a tell because the worst thing to do is limp in with the hand you're hoping to raise and having it go six ways to the flop. So really generally don't do it unless you have very strong reason to do so, but it's a strategy you can throw in there to get more relative position. It's kind of like, um, you know, adjusting raise size bigger is how you can get absolute position more often and using the smallest raise size or the limp is a way you can get relative position more often. So in summary, I hope you guys are with me because that was a lot of information. And if it just blew by you, don't worry. There will be a replay. You can watch it again, or you can pause the video and play it back. But I'm going to summarize it here so that it will solidify in your minds. And if you've taken notes, congratulations, you get five points. Number one, position is a key element of the triple threat and a winning poker formula. Number two, position gives you the information advantage and the right to last action, many benefits. Number three, there are two types of position, relative and absolute. 
Number four, please start thinking of the button as the money chip and you will win more money. Simple as that. Number five, the action and money flows through and to the player in position. Be the player with the best position and the money is going to flow right to you. Number six, building on number five, if you wanna loosen up your game, exaggerate your position, your adjustments to the in position spots. Don't loosen up from all positions. Loosen up a little bit from early position if you even want to, but loosen up a ton from late position. Open way more hands on the cutoff and button. Three bet people when they're opening, when you have position, and really focus on those late seats where you are almost guaranteed absolute position, and there is a very low chance of you running into a strong hand behind you. Number seven, to play in position more often, look left, get those tells, and adjust your raise sizes pre-flop. If you want to know more about this, I'm happy to talk about this. Uh, live tells and relational dynamics and metagame is one of my favorite things in poker. I absolutely love it. Um, eight, the free card play and the free showdown play are only available in position. And finally, number nine, stack depth is the great amplifier of the power of position. The deeper the stacks, the more valuable position is, the shallower the stacks, the less valuable it is, but it always has value, it always has merits, and it's always better to have position than to not have position. If you're gonna play without position, you better have a good reason to, like a good hand, good odds, or a really good read on your opponent. And that's it. Hello everyone, I'm Jonathan Little. I hope you're enjoying this Thanksgiving Day Marathon. Let me take a second to talk to you about the live webinars that I and my coaches host each month for PokerCoaching.com. Whenever I made the site, I asked, what do I wish I had in a training site? Or what did I wish young Jonathan Little had? And both present day Jonathan Little and young Jonathan Little both wanted to be able to get on the line watch presentations and interact with the best players in the world. So I have gone through immense efforts to get all of these coaches here to produce educational content for you that you can learn from. So in addition to all the other training content that is part of pokercoaching.com, including over 650 interactive quizzes, 20 video classes, and a lot of past webinars, we also add at least one challenge webinar each month, which is an in-depth question, essentially, that makes you really take your time and learn how to play poker well. We also have two other live coaching webinars each month for the poker coaching members. And if you really want to take your game to the next level, check out Poker Coaching Premium. There we have at least four live coaching webinars added every single month. And we're going to continuously add more and more content. I mean, at this point, there are over 110 classes, 30-minute videos on specific topics to the point where if you have a question about poker, if you're not sure about something, go to the pokercoaching.com class, uh, premium classes and you will find the answer. So to get significantly discounted memberships to both of these only for Black Friday, head over to pokercoaching.com slash Black Friday right now Put in the effort, take your game to the next level, and win life-changing money.